Hey y'all, Scott here. So, it's about that time. Let's have the talk. Let's talk about birds, bees, hell, even sex. I've gone across the country teaching the proper education professionally, and I've learned it all from this here book. So, let's start with chapter one, Luigi's Mansion. I gotta make some calls. It's finally that time of the year. E3 2001 occurred from May 17th to the 19th in 2001 at the Los Angeles Convention Center as any E3 2001 would. And this year for gaming as a whole had some of the most iconic releases of all time. Massive console launches like the GameCube, Game Boy Advance, Xbox, the PlayStation 2 was still in its first year on the market and Sega finally did the right thing. Give up. Every couple of years we hit one in the industry where Everything happens. All the games release, new consoles launch, and the only year that I think even remotely matches 2001 it would be 2013. But even then, I think overall, 2001 may have been the biggest year for video games of all time. God, Scott, stop sucking the year off! Well, let's dive into what occurred at E3 2001, and as per usual, be rating each major company's presence at the show on a scale of 1 to 5 neat slaps. Let's start with a company that needs no introduction. Final few years of the Nintendo 64, well, they sure were years. We did get some amazing games during this time, but they were going up against the launch of the Dreamcast and PlayStation 2 alongside all the titles coming out for the 10 times as popular PlayStation 1. Dr. Mario 64, brace yourselves, wasn't gonna cut it. And looking back at the history of E3s, the past few years really felt like Nintendo was spinning their wheels. While other companies were pushing forward with new tech, and Nintendo was saying, no, -uh, we have a new console. All right, can we see it? You can see Mario Party 3. The 64 was just kind of in existence for a while now, but E3 2001 was Nintendo's first E3 show for not only the GameCube, but the Game Boy Advance as well. Yeah, read off that spiral notebook. This isn't a press conference, it's a book report. We're still in that era of press conferences where press conferences were press conferences, damn it. For some reason going on about how the GameCube has a shot against the competition via graphs. Well, this graph would have more value if you show me the games that would give it a shot against the competition. This conference had the theme of the Nintendo difference. What are you, a brand of paper towel? Now, according to Nintendo, the Nintendo difference is this. An absolute fetish for quality. Hey, guy, what's your fetish? Uh, well, quality, quantity, the pursuit of happiness, ass and chips. Satoru Iwata comes on stage just a year before he became president of Nintendo, discussing how games all look the same and really leans into the Nintendo difference. Now, over on Nintendo, in comparison, it's all about innovation and quality. They released this a month prior. Miyamoto comes out on stage and holy sh**, he's one hand in that bitch! Bill Trennan accompanies them for translation and introduces the first game with the concept of trying to figure out what characters to bring to GameCube first. <laughs> Technicality. Super Smash Bros. Melee revealed to the world with the opening cutscene and a short overview of the characters. They don't spend long on it considering you get the general idea of what this is by reading the title. Melee's reveal will forever be one of the best E3 moments, as you can tell just how giddy and excited the audience is. Watching it now is like opening a time capsule, and whenever Samus appeared, everybody roared since this was during a large gap between Metroid games. Zelda and Sheik were given a huge applause compared to the one guy recognizing ice climbers. Scientists studied this man afterwards. How does one man remember that much ice climber? Melee was the Smash Brothers series transition from a fun party fighter to a massive gaming event. The bombastic orchestral music, Gorgeous graphical upgrade, iconic characters paired up with those who haven't seen the light of day in ages. Melee's reveal was the perfect introduction to GameCube and also showed this console was hopeless. You practically launch a system with a game that invokes this kind of reaction and it gets third place. This marked a change in consoles. It was no longer enough to have the best exclusive games. You had to have multimedia features or a gimmick and the GameCube had a calendar. After Smash, we get a look at what's called the next in the Mario series. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the next in the Mario series. So I like Luigi's Mansion, but the way it was shown here felt more like a joke. And I think a lot of critics had this feeling towards Luigi's Mansion when it first launched. The stigma that it was 
lame as shit. You're not getting a Mario platformer at launch, you're getting his drippy nosed brother with a shop back. As time went on, I think everybody's come to appreciate this game a whole lot more, but at E3 2001, the main thing Nintendo pushed with it was how it utilized the GameCube's capabilities. They showed off the controller, which the Wave Bird has a different button layout from the wired one. Why do that? The game discs, which Nintendo bragged about being severely anti-piracy as a selling point. Here's our product, and the best part about it is you can steal it. The GameCube startup is shown prior to the Luigi's Mansion demo and gets applause. As it should. And we get a demo for Luigi's Mansion, which again was created to show off the GameCube's capabilities. Dual analog control along with tons of elemental effects. It was impressive, no doubt, but the fact it wasn't a Mario game and was a Luigi game just made it kind of lame for many. It's pretty shallow that various people thought that way, but that's what the general consensus was at the time. And the way they showed it off here, well fine, I think undersold the game quite a bit, even if it looked very graphically impressive. Interestingly, they state right after the demo how the Game Boy Advance can be used as a GameCube controller, but the way they talked about it implied it would work with Luigi's Mansion, which would have made sense. I mean, you have the Game Boy Horror in the game to have a map screen on the Game Boy screen at all times would have been handy. But no, they just move on to more graphs and sp Spec talk, which is very unlike Nintendo. What is like Nintendo is to show us something we can't have. Damn. The Panasonic Q, the Japanese only GameCube with the DVD player, was shown here for. Spice? They just kind of show it like this is for the Japanese market, so I don't think they ever really had plans to bring it over here. But they also had it on display at the E3 2001 show floor. If I had to guess, even if they were never gonna sell it in the US, just having a GameCube with DVD playing capabilities at the show would be enough for people to think the GameCube was actually worth a damn. It, yeah, you can play DVDs on it, you just uh need to be able to deadlift 400 pounds. Some developers are shown in a video talking about the GameCube, namely Silicon Knights, Rare, and Retro Studios, all showing off games that were barely real. Retro had Ravenblade! Yeah, sure, honey, I'm on the phone. Rare had Cameo and Donkey Kong Racing, but titles like Metroid Prime, Eternal Darkness, and Star Fox Adventures were displayed, with Star Fox Adventures having the subtitle of Dinosaur Planet. This is awesome to see in the context of an actual press conference. For so long, I've only known of the origins of Star Fox Adventures through articles or random trailers, but actually seeing it alongside Donkey Kong Racing and Ravenblade at E3 shows, it's pretty wild and gives a much better idea as to how these games were positioned back then. Next up, we have a brand new game from Nintendo. What the hell was that? Nintendo announced Pikmin as their next Pokemon in the sense that it may not make sense now, but just you wait. Give it some time. A quick demo is shown, and Miyamoto says that he got the idea of Pikmin from gardening. You're selling a console! The GameCube is set to launch on November 5th in North America, September 14th in Japan, and 2002 in Europe to the audible disappointment of the audience. Liar! It actually ended up launching on the 18th in North America, but I'll let this one slide due to the scissor reel at the end. Star Wars Rogue Leader, Raven Blade, Wave Race BS, NBA Courtside 2002, Donkey Kong Racing, Animal Force for GameCube. Interestingly, they announced this a month after the game launched on the Nintendo 64 in Japan. Metroid Prime, Mario Kart for GameCube, just using Smash Brothers character models and go-karts. Mickey for GameCube. All right. The delay was worth it. Ending things on that infamous Zelda for GameCube demo, showing a realistic Link and Ganondorf fighting, to which one year later, we got a puppet show instead. Why wasn't any of this sprinkled throughout the press conference? Instead we got, did you know the GameCube is going to do well? Well, if you showed me Mickey for GameCube earlier, that wouldn't be a question. There's quite a lot to like about this showing, though interesting to note, Nintendo barely talked about the Game Boy Advance. For that, you'd have to check out the show floor. This giant screen saying, fun fact, to ensure innovation, we employ the strongest and most successful exclusive game development resources in the world. World. That's not a fact, that's just smug. I love this rotating actual GameCube logo and the Game Boy Advance demo unit showing games like Mario Kart Super Circuit, F-Zero Maximum Velocity, Wario Land 4. This was a damn good show. Though their presentation seems better on paper because when you actually watch it... And more innovation we need on display when our Space World exhibition brings me right back to economics class. It may have felt like there were a lot of games, but it was primarily just Smash Brothers, Luigi's Mansion, and Pikmin. Everything else was just sort of thrown in a scissor reel. They still did a good job impressing, and that's more evident by taking a look at the show floor, though Nintendo just didn't show much that clawed people away from the PlayStation 2, unfortunately. Yeah, Smash Brothers looked amazing, but did that make up for the relative lack of third-party support? To some, yeah. And I think something big Nintendo proved this E3 was a massive change to their software output. That slowed down to a crawl on Nintendo 64, but with the GameCube, they showed off a ton of exclusive games in development, most of which came out within the first year or two. Nintendo in 2001, keep it up. Well, let's take a breather in the form of E3 2001 memorabilia. These Activision 02 hats were given out. Activision 02 was a sub-brand they used for their sports games. Cause sports require oxygen. Well, that was fun. Let's move on to Sony. Well, let's see how good boy PlayStation did this year. They have the best selling console of all time. Again, so why even try? Well, Kazurai, 
just stepped off the golf course. It's crazy to see these iconic Sony executives there so long ago. Uh, Jack Trenton, Andrew House, the king's all here, which means their first announcement must be big. First, we will debut a DVD wireless remote. I stand corrected. Fucking huge. Gran Turismo 3 gets a trailer, even though it's already been out in Japan. Jack and Daxter gets a trailer and demo, being the big holiday title for the PS2 that year, being poised as the PlayStation 2's Crash Bandicoot. But who gives a shit when the PS1 LCD screen is announced? I think it says right here. The PS1 is still a lucrative piece of Sony's business. While the show is all about PS2, they still intended on giving their first console some proper support. Sony's done that with all of their consoles. Even when the PS4 came out, they released Gran Turismo 6 exclusively on the PS3 a month later. They highlight that Square will remain exclusive to PlayStation consoles for the time being, which showcased how powerful this partnership was at the time. But with all this power and having the most successful console out at the time, that meant 10 minutes of EA Sports. Wow, Madden 2002's on the PlayStation 2? These mad sons of bitches finally did it! If this was the first Madden on PS2 or on this generation of game systems in general, I'd understand a gameplay demo for the conference. Final Fantasy X is shown, like, my god, can you believe how fast they were pumping these games out at the time? Final Fantasy was practically a yearly series at this point. 7, 8, and 9 coming out one after another made some sense with them all being on the same console, but 10 was for the PlayStation 2 and still released just a year after 9. They show a movie trailer for Final Fantasy, The Spirits Within. Then we dive into some other big PS2 exclusives, a long, long speech about Devil May Cry, then onto Silent Hill 2, and finally a trailer for Metal Gear Solid 2, which was pretty much E3's darling game at this point. Grabbing everybody's attention, this was the killer app for the time. They end things off with some accessories, a PS2 network adapter and hard drive, along with an LCD screen, keyboard, and mouse for... Who did this? I have never seen the PlayStation 2 marketed as a straight up desktop PC. They say this is for email. This! They also show a bit of SOCOM, kind of to push the online capabilities of the console. With the Xbox looming over, that was smart to do considering that system was far ahead of the PS2 in terms of internet connectivity. Yeah, you know, Sony did have some of the biggest names on their side, and just looking at their booth, it's quite obvious not only did they have the biggest names, they had all the names. The amount of games on display for PS2 was staggering, and while Nintendo gave you a reason to check out their stuff, Sony gave you a reason to buy their stuff. The PS2 obviously had a tremendous future in front of it. They were even talking about streaming HD movies to the console. This! I may be a Nintendo, we'll say fan, and while E3 2001 had a lot to make me happy, it was also obvious who was gonna truly win this generation. Let's return to E3 memorabilia. Here we have an E3 2001 program giving out on the second day of the event. It's designed as if it's a magazine, featuring advertisements that look ripped right out of one, except they're actively begging you to check their booth at E3 out. This is absolutely fascinating. Reading articles detailing the announcement of Kingdom Hearts, which, yeah, debuted here, in a match made in gamer heaven, only. Articles detailing Xbox and Nintendo's booths, giving attendees the motivation to keep it up. What other companies have brought to the show, whether it's games, hardware, accessories. There's interviews, conference schedules, maps, the Mario Awards. Nintendo of America would award their retail partners with Mario Awards based on categories like their catalog, magazine, promotions, in-store flyers. That gave good motivation to advertise Nintendo. See, we could put the PlayStation there, but we're neck and neck with Sears here. Do Wario. Hell, even advertisements for DVD scratch removal machines are here. This entire thing feels like I'm where I don't belong. Shuttle services and food options, Namco is outright begging for applicants. This is an awesome piece of E3 history that truly does give you the feeling of actually being there. It's a little big though. But what's this? Xbox? Who's that? While Microsoft had a presence at E3 2000, 2001 was the year of the system's launch and gave us a much better idea of what we could expect. The console's design was finalized, making it much more consumer friendly. Oh, come on, that's a choking hazard. And a little game called Halo, which was shown last year, went from a third person game for PC and Mac to a first person shooter launching exclusively with Xbox. This was always the go to game for Xbox, as outside of that, it was a pretty mediocre show for them. They were still in the peach fuzz era of understanding gaming. They got it much more than other companies did, but this was their first console, so the hiccups were to be expected. However, going against Nintendo and Sony, Microsoft had a few technical problems during their conference and not nearly as many games on display. They had Dead or Alive 3 as an exclusive for launch alongside Oddworld Munch's Odyssey. Racing games like Project Gotham and NASCAR Heat impressed, but Microsoft's booth was half Xbox and half PC gaming. The launch date of November 8th, 2001 for North America was announced. LIAR! November 15th, and a launch in Japan 
Japan would occur before Europe, which many people already knew was a mistake. The Xbox has famously never done well in Japan. Many knew the Japanese market wouldn't take to Xbox, but Microsoft sure wanted them to considering modern gaming was practically born in Japan. But all this did was waste Microsoft's time by launching in Japan before Europe and piss off customers in Europe because they had to wait longer. All for a retail price of $299, which was fairly expensive, though with the Xbox being the most powerful of the main three consoles and with Halo as the killer app, it sufficed. But it's pretty clear, without Halo, this would have been a pretty weak showing. But Microsoft came out swinging with one of the most iconic launch titles of all time. That's gotta count for something. Grand Theft Auto 3. Yeah, there was quite a lot more to this E3 than just what the big three brought to the table. Namely, Rockstar brought the big three. I even have the final part of E3 2001 memorabilia, the sticker they gave out. All right, yep, take a look at that. Okay. Duke Nukem Forever made another appearance, this time looking quite a bit different from the last time we saw it. This one showcasing how truly expansive the game was going to be. Look at all these environments, characters, things that do epic music. None of it ever happened. Sega was everywhere this year, making deals all over the place with the announcement that Dreamcast would be fizzling and Sega as a company would become a third party. Each console manufacturer made a deal to get a certain Sega franchise on it exclusively, most notably Sonic on Nintendo. The sheer amount of massive industry-defining games to come out of this E3 is unprecedented. Prior years felt like growing pains, but E3 2001 truly does feel like where E3 became E3 from there on out. Wait a second. No, I'm just confused.